Welcome. This is Shepard F Weekly Take. Uh, sorry, episode 40, Take Two. Actually, because we we're talking like 15 minutes, and then we realized that the recording isn't working. That went really well. Yeah. Uh, so let's jump on the point where we were when we realized that the recording is. But no. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> let's see where we, go, where we get back and where, what we, get, we need to repeat. But it is 17th of May. Uh, it is Friday uh, day before, well, the Friday before SharePoint conference. And because of the SharePoint conference next week, next week we're not going to record this on Monday like we typically do. Uh, well, that won't be an SP conference. I will that be. Will be. Uh, and I think our visitor, you will not be in a SharePoint conference either, right? No. Alex. I had to. I'm going to collapse on it instead. Yes, indeed. Now, uh, and on that point, we didn't actually introduce our visitor. So, Simon, can you do a quick intro who you are uh, again? <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, um, my name is Simon Ogren, or Simon Ogren in Swedish, and I live in northern Sweden in a place called Umeå. And as you said, we saw last time, close to the <laughs> Finnish border. <laughs> it is pretty close to Finnish border, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, there's a, a pretty there's it, Umea, I know Umea because there's a boat coming from Vasa to Umea yeah. and they go uh, yeah. all the way down. We so. used to ride over there when we were kids. Yeah. And, uh, it was like a, what's it called, amusement park, Vasa Land. Oh, yes, it was. That went bankrupt. Yeah. I always is I that also, the boat on the way back. <laughs> is that also the same place where is, there is the um, museum of, that, of the ship that would uh, sail away and that would just just drown yep. or yeah drown yeah, in, that's on, a, yeah, in the harbor that's a that's a vasa boat but that's actually located in stockholm uh which was I, a i know of that but i mean did did the boat sail from from the, the I, harbor? I think it was named based on the city in the oh, okay. city gotcha. in finland which when finland was still part of sweden uh, there's so, also there's actually a guy named Gustav Vasa. He was some sort of king well. or something like that. Yeah, that's true. So, okay, okay. So, third, the boat, third, so the boat, right? and the place Don't are named after me about him. history, please. Yeah. <laughs> so what did you do? So in in 2006, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's actually on that one. I have to say <laughs> quick note. When they actually rose, uh, when they they found took the the boat in the Stockholm or very close to Stockholm, uh, they they were able to locate the boat. Uh, they found it and then they they took it up from the sea. And uh, there was actually a Finnish students. They made a joke. So they actually dive in and they put a statue of the Paavo Nurmi, who is a Finnish runner, on the front of the boat. So when they, they actually took this boat up from like 1600, there was a the statue of Finnish runner on, on the front. It's just like, really? <laughs> but but a good, good practical joke, if nothing else. Yeah. So. Finish. <laughs> always, always joking, huh? Yeah, well, yeah, the, we, we actually we didn't talk about this one in the first recording, uh, but uh, Finland kind of considers Sweden as the big brother. Uh, so uh, not in the way the big brother series, but rather in the way of we're kind of a friends, we get along, but we see them as the, the country which we're kind of following uh, because they're bigger, there's more population and all of that. So, um, so especially in the past that I think uh, so. Uh, and we are anyway a smaller country. So Sweden is a slightly bigger than Scandinavia. We didn't discuss our the other visitor we have. Uh, oh, good point. Yes. Yeah. Um, that comes down, actually. Uh, you had a, a good story, Simon. How did you end up in SharePoint? And that I think yeah. that came from there. So you need to actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah actually, my, my first encounter was like five years ago with SharePoint. And I ended up in a classroom four days with, with uh, Irvin. So it was like, OK, so you have never worked with SharePoint. I'm going to teach you SharePoint in four days. This is not, we were like, no, of course you can teach us SharePoint in four days. We know everything. Nah, <laughs> in yeah, four days. Yeah, Good luck with that. Okay. <laughs> so, 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 I, I saw his sweat running down his forehead. Yeah, like, 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 oh, <laughs> not again. So, they just, so, 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 so the one thing I'm interested in, is like, because I recall mine, but what was your, your, your experience first when you heard of the site collections versus sites? Uh, I mean, a lot was confusing. We we kind of like, OK, dive into this lab and make a web part. What the? F oh, I, I can't say that. What yeah, yeah this is a family show. You can't use that language. What the fruit? Uh, web part. What the fruit? <laughs> but but I, I remember that. What the feature? Know, I remember that the sites, the site collections, 
I did. I didn't even know what what the difference no. was. No, and I think still, it took me like, yeah, yeah. Originally, when I when I heard about it, I think it would take me like seriously a few months to wrap my head on like what is like difference yeah. between us, and then somewhere yeah. in code, I was like SP side versus SP web, huh? And no, that's that's, that's actually not, one of the kind of makes sense. Uh, one of the benefits of the future, considering the fact that we're heading more and more to the direction where a site collection is a site, and that's it. And there's no subsites in the in well, the, the but then you have like thing. ten years of UI sure, to align sure, and absolutely, absolutely. Like some, but yes, that's really the key challenge of site collection. We have a massive, massive package uh, with SharePoint to do the historical things because um, it, it is, I think Jeff Deeper was part of the original team creating uh, Tahoe back in 2001. It's 2019. Wow. So there's a lot of kind of historical package uh, which we're still carrying with us. Um, so. Yeah. But hey, uh, one step at a time. And I, and I think uh, it kind of relates on the discussion, which we did not actually uh, record, but I wanted to actually tie in uh, mm -hmm. to mention that one as well. We talked about the fact that you can in the past, we were bending SharePoint in an imaginable ways, especially mm -hmm. when you're an inexperienced developer. You don't have that much experience. You don't think about the return of investment, and you oh, don't have the... I think you're mixing up two things. Developers never think on, about return on investment. No, no, I, I didn't say that. <laughs> can you, can you quote wrong. you on that? <laughs> Sorry. But but in a way that uh, in a, in a SharePoint we used to kind of uh, do whatever uh, in a dot com sites you you made SharePoint look not SharePoint right yes um, that was the whole point that was the whole point you you don't want that to look like SharePoint uh, well there's still dot com sites which look like SharePoint as well but hey um, mm. but we've kind of moved more and more to, towards the direction where we are slightly more limited and especially now that Microsoft actually explicitly calls out what should be documented, uh, uh, customized, and whatnot. I think mm -hmm. that's a beneficial thing, hopefully, for people as well. Well, but I guess so, that was the whole point, right? There was a time when, where um, actually the Microsoft team would say, it's perfectly fine to do internet sites, it's perfectly fine to do this. Mm -hmm. it's so it's not like people try to cross the limit of the product. It was more like product was being positioned as suitable for everything, as the right. Swiss knife of the web. Yep. Like you can, you want to have collaboration environment, SharePoint. You want to have internet site, SharePoint. You want to have multilingual portal, sure, SharePoint. And over yep. time we learned that it's, it's not the most optimal thing for everything. Well, so and kind of stuck yeah. at the tailor-made stuff there. We need to tailor-made this. We need to make it not look at SharePoint. And then we just go exactly. to town and kind of like, over branding stuff, but I mean, I think it's a part of the organical move towards not doing as much customization. But you know, as I've also matured, as we discussed earlier, I, I don't recommend doing the same amount of customizations. I mean, we kind of more like work with SharePoint now, right? Well, <laughs> we sure. Broke, sure. It, broke it the right way. But yeah, I guess yeah. so. That is an interesting that's point. That's why, by the way, that's why Parker Porcupine is such a good mascot for SharePoint. Because yeah. if you stroke it in the right way, it's it's not going to hurt you. If you do it in the wrong way, ah, uh, <laughs> that's deep. That's deep. <laughs> I didn't see that well. <laughs> but I guess that is an interesting point because over the last few months, I talked more to customers than I think I've done before in in all the years, um, and it only proves the point that being deaf, that wasn't really my job to talk to customers. Um, and the one thing I realized is that it's not necessarily true that people are all nowadays customize less. Because one thing that we see, like SPFX is still, or is, the hardest growing development model of yep. all time. Yep. So people still build things, but they do it differently. They don't spend yep. as much effort on, on UI or trying to change the UI that is out the of the pros, box as opposite to the things, extend yeah. what they can do with that, yeah. that really yields the benefit to them. Yeah. yeah, that's a better way of saying it. And I totally agree. I mean, I do some SPFX occasionally. I do. <laughs> <laughs> you I maybe touched I SPFX a few times. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. true. 
that's true. Uh, and and obviously, in on-premises, you were always having the opportunity of of doing uh, then server-side changes and significant changes there. We had the server-side time of jobs and everything else. Now we're in Azure, which is a completely different ball game um, and different options and massive amount of additional opportunities as well. Yeah. Uh, but which isn't and really ship on extensibility anymore. It's it's kind of offloaded somewhere else. But I guess that that brings us also to an interesting point, and it might be me opening can of worms while while we only have. 20 minutes to go or a little more. But the other day I talked to a customer who are on, on, on-prem and they say they make deliberate choice to use server-side OM still yep. to benefit of the fact that they chose to be on-premises. Yep. Because, because for our them, they would say, so we invested, we made deliberate choice to be on-premises, but then we would build everything in a cloud-ready way with all the cons of that while we are perfectly fine to build things on premises because we are on premises because that was our choice to be on premises. True, true, true. Debatable as well. Now, um, and that's as long as that decision is being done knowingly the implications. Yes. And I think yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's really the key. Um, and maybe in if you're not experienced enough, you don't make those decisions knowing the, all of the implications or yes. enough of the implications to to, to, to understand the long-term impact. But hey, um, and ever, as long as that decision has been documented in a right way, that whenever there's a complete change of people who are working in that project, they can actually find the decision. We made a dis- uh, explicit decision because of blah, 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 which makes perfect sense. That's the so, reason. Yeah. Whatever the reason would be. No, yeah. it's, it's absolutely makes sense. Um, rather than, because especially in on-premises, every now and then you need to bend, then the, there's a limited set of CSAM APIs, there's a limited set of REST APIs, as an example, and then you start... Especially on-prem. Yes, uh, bending yeah. those in a wrong way, and uh, it get, might get actually really messy. So. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, uh, any, should we go to the articles, actually? Yes. Or, yeah, we have let's, articles, let's we have news, the, the weekly discussions. news. We have weekly news. So let's actually get in here. Uh, let me share my... Last part. week in the community. Last week. Oh, let's actually use Flash feature first. <laughs> yes. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Welcome. This is SharePoint of Weekly today. Um, so, um, SharePoint conference coming up next week. Uh, just pinpointing for this one. If you are, I think you can still get tickets for it. So this is your last chance. You, we are releasing this video on Tuesday, 22nd or 21st of May. So <laughs> you might still actually get a massive kind of a demand on, I want to be there on Wednesday and Thursday. If you live in Vegas or, or around, if you are already there, you yeah. might just drive and go. <laughs> that is true. That is true. It is an MTM MTM grant. Uh, it is a. We were there last week, uh, last year as well. So it's it's pretty nice location. Um, so it is a nice setup. Absolutely. Uh, the and you don't have to walk as much as in the classic Chicago Ignite. Uh, I don't know if your Waldeck were actually there. Yes, that's, I was. I was there. Was, I was there. Yeah. But you still need to walk because the MTM is big as well. So I heard that the other one in or, um, Orlando was even worse. No, I, I don't think Orlando is actually worse. I think Orlando is much better than Chicago. Chicago okay. was, if you talk about the, the Ignite and the walking. The venue, yeah, yeah, like, the, like the, from the one end was, to another. Wow. To Chicago, I still remember we had a pre-day in Chicago. I don't know how we ended up on this discussion. We had a pre-day in Chicago. Um, and when we had a lunch, we had a one-hour lunch break. It took us 20 minutes, seriously, to walk from the room to the queue of the lunch. And oh. then I realized, well, that I need to start walking back because I need to be on time on the. It's, wow. Yeah. Um, that would not happen in MTM or in Orlando. In so. Finland. Well, definitely. <laughs> in no, no, I think, yeah, people, um, <laughs> yes, distances, Sweden, like, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> or Finland. <laughs> Anyway, um, the, the week after SBC, uh, there's then the European Collaboration Summit. I think uh, European Collaboration Summit just broke 2,000 attendees. Uh, I, I saw that in Twitter, which is pretty cool. It is a community-driven conference, a no-profit conference, so it's a slightly different uh, than SBC. Um, but and it's that's why it's actually quite much cheaper as well. Uh, so, but it, you still have more time joining on European Collaboration Summit. I don't know actually if it's run out of tickets already. There might be some limits on the attendee numbers. I don't know. Um, because the venue actually is certain sized. But anyway, so that's a week after. Uh, where do we actually have the dates? Where, where are the dates? Where are the dates? What? 
I think it's from the 20th. May 27. May 27. There you go. 29. So okay, there we go. Oh, it's already May. No, just kidding. Um, so uh, moving on Someone to the actual should. articles. Yes, some what some people say it's already May. So uh, David Warner uh, had a really nice video here and an article related on SharePoint library second. components optimized bundling. Sorry. The second. Yeah, the second. <laughs> David Warner, the second. <laughs> yes. Uh, so um, and this is basically so there is a a. Uh, introduction on the uh, well, sorry, David did a video uh, around uh, the library components uh, in one of the community calls already, and I think this is a kind of a follow up on that, and then talking about the similar topics as well. But really uh, good setup and good discussion point. Library components are still in preview, but they're heading to GA as part of the 1.9 release of SharePoint framework, which we don't have a public date yet but it's coming relatively soon not oh, next it week it will be actually. available on tuesday eight no. eight tuesday yeah. no eight, eight tuesday. tuesday the eight, eight tuesday, tuesday is a good way yes. of putting that so the first tuesday next week the eight tuesday in one month some of the months or whatever. some of the months <laughs> yeah. now Stop the reason why it's going to be an a tuesday is that we are looking into actually moving into this monthly releases uh, cycle yeah. uh, relatively soon start starting already in uh, june potentially and it's going to be i think we're targeting and i can promise this yet but our target is the second tuesday of every single month um why tuesday because then if something goes sideways completely on the release we still have wednesday and thursday to get it out because you should not ship on friday so, so well that also yeah and that that is on your, um, that is on my shirt as well yeah. yeah now i'm in a small screen so people can't actually <laughs> see that. Anyway. so well well that that Are align also with the releases of uh csom and powershell will that be aligned like all of it will come on uh, well, no well. no because the csom and powershell doesn't have a dependency on spfx so the csom and powershell is released once a month as well uh, we aligned that on a once a month cycle already three years ago or something like that when i moved to engineering and started releasing those in a once a month uh, cycle um, and the, the reason for that one was that people are then more aware when something is coming out uh, so that they can prepare beforehand that okay, I know it is the last Friday of every single month when the CSM and PowerShell shipment online PowerShell is released. That's it. Um, so then you can actually prepare your own internal process for that. And in the same way, we are heading to there with SPFX. We want to give you an exact date or a proximity of the date so you can actually prepare your upgrades and plans based on that. So, sorry, Simon, you were about to say something when. No, <laughs> it was just a, it was just a bad joke. <laughs> I was just okay, thinking yeah, next. about Helios, like always be shipping. He needs to add, like, but not on Fridays, something like that. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> not on Fridays. Well, um, um, re real men ship on, uh, um, on Fridays. Yeah, yeah, you exactly. Why not do and that? Because... Spend, the, spend the end, entire weekend patching yes. it. Yes. Yes, yes. exactly. Yes. I, I I still I can so Yolo. much relate. Uh, I can so much relate on the fact that when we did those on-premises SharePoint updates, and we started doing those on Saturday, and then uh, every now and then it went completely sideways, and then it's a Sunday, 10 p.m., and you're still kind of a, I need to get this up. It's 10 10,000 people coming tomorrow morning. I need to get this up. Ah. Yeah, but I guess it only proves the point, right? It's, it's like, is the thing and sure it's not not comparable on the other hand maybe it is right if i look for example at cli like we ship every week every weekend a beta and then once every month the beta becomes the release yep mm. and and a release is just push of a code that have, that has been tested and and vetted and so the release itself doesn't really mean anything there is sure. no like hours of process that can go wrong. Sure, I mean, if our CI CD would fail, the release would fail, yeah. but okay, then, then we just trigger another one and that is it. Or if there is downtime in CI, then we wait and then we release that. So there's, yeah. it's not a massive complexity thing. Sure. And well, like since, since I, I wouldn't say stop contributing to the Office 365 CLI, but kind of like paused it. You're on you, sabbatical. You, yeah, exactly. <laughs> then, then it's then it's much easier for you because you don't have to you don't have to do all the stuff to make sure everything works again. So no, 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 I mean, I mean, no, no, so 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 that is actually 
that is decoupled. Like a PR is a separate thing. When PR yeah. is vet, like every PR we have is vetted, reviewed, approved, adjusted. So when it's merged, sure, there can be always bug. But if there's a bug, well, next weekend we have next release. So exactly. exactly. That's the beauty of the the consistent way of releasing stuff. Um, and so they're doing that's... a really good job at it. I I, I have to say it's uh, it's really organized in a good way for being open source. Yeah, and I guess that well, we have to do it because it's not a full time job for me to maintain CLI. It's a yeah. side thing, and it's it's a community thing as well. So I cannot be the only person that is able to do do a release. We automated all of it. So if yeah. you have permission to push code, you can do a release. As simple as that. Yep. Absolutely. It's almost the same as with the BMP CSAM uh, NuGet or BMP PowerShell. Um, mm -hmm. It's all automated as much as possible, everybody. And, and there should not be a single point of failure in this thing. Yeah. And sorry, by the way, David, we are having a, a really interesting discussion on your screen. So <laughs> you're getting more information yeah. on your website. Like de derailed. <laughs> derailed slightly. Okay, moving on on the, on the articles. <laughs> Let's see how do we, where we ended up with Sebastian's, uh, how to search uh, your HubSign data using SharePoint Search API. We did yes, actually April, cover April this already. Uh, it is April 23rd. Uh, it is my mistake. Uh, so we actually had this one already, but this is more and more important as the hub sites will grow their role uh, more and more. Um, there will be hub site announcements uh, next week in SBC. So it's really important to understand how the hub sites behave. And you how heard it here behave. first. They, there will be announcements at ESPC. Well, no, about the video hub goes live on Tuesday. So, hmm. So if you miss the yesterday's announcements from <laughs> no 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 the announcements will be go live on Tuesday morning as well so it depends if on you miss to, if you miss <laughs> today's announcements <laughs> yes and Anna sure Melissa who owns will be announced will have a sessions uh, later than next week as well or this week depending on when you watch or week before depending on when you're watching the video right next tab <laughs> that's complicated. <laughs> Okay, um, creating an access token for a service in SPFX, and this one is from May 14th from uh, from Paolo. Uh, Paolo is, is working for PSH.com. And this is really around, let's see, uh, how do we actually grant the access token for SPFX, uh, and how does it actually work? And how does the third-party APIs work in the, in the SPFX as well? Mm -hmm. Uh, one point here to note uh, uh, also is that it's it's around handling of the of the access token. Uh, if you are using an isolated web part, um, I, we should have this one documented properly here as well. And if the isolated web part is requesting uh, uh, access tokens, it will automatically create a specific Azure AD application for per, per that solution, which is a good uh, thing to remember. So. You can have a isolated grants and permissions spell web part as long as the web parts are being isolated, and this is a setting actually in the in the web config. So it is we're asking that actually in here, uh, which is the component requires a permission access web API, and it actually is I think we are actually uh, there it is uh, it is in the packet solution is domain isolated property is set to true, and that will then generate the automatic things. And that bring, brings us, I think, also to an interesting discussion point that we can maybe spend a minute or two on. Like, interesting to me is that this is now developers' decision to run isolated or not. Where in reality, me, I would say it is an admin who would say, I have a package from a vendor maybe with whom we don't have a deep relationship or trust. I want to isolate it, or there is something specific to it. So it doesn't. It's not defined by the package, but it's defined deployment time by the admin who can say, you know what, it, this one I want to isolate. Yeah. So we would be able to absolutely relatively easily introduce a, a checkbox or an option uh, in a deploy functionality when you're adding an SPPKT file to the app yep. catalog, which is then I want this one to be isolated, which which is a fair point. Uh, mm -hmm. It is slightly kind of a confusing that it's a developer decision. At the same time, this is the, the first version and we yep. evolve things as we move along. Um, yep. You might also argue that, well, every single admin should know exactly what they're deploying. So uh, they no, should I'm... be able to. I, I do understand that that is not reality, but the admin ultimately is responsible of deploying stuff in App Catalog. So the administrator uh, and the solutions which are getting deployed in the tenant should be vetted and signed off yeah. using whatever process. I think I would like to rephrase that. 
I uh, agree with you, but I think I, I I would like to say that admin should 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 be, should should be able to make educated decision about what they put in production, and because they sure. do not read read code, they need to have tooling that allows them to understand what is it that they put Absolutely. in production, and Absolutely. and only Absolutely. to have a zip and then having to go through code and XML. That no. is not a. That no. is not, not the right way. Whenever you have a SPVK file which contains a unique permissions or permission grants, it is actually notified for the administrator. Yeah, yeah. This package, this package is actually containing unique permissions and access to Azure API. Are you sure that you want to do this? Uh, so because it grants access to those graph APIs. So yeah. there is an additional set of kind of information, but I do agree with you. We can yeah. make it more better. Uh, in the future in the deployment of things. So, and that's one of the things what we're absolutely doing in the, if I put my engineering hat on and SPFX uh, PM hat on, uh, we're looking into more and more, uh, let's say, polish the experiences what we're having. So not just introducing new features, um, because like we talked a few times in SPDEV a weekly already, uh, I think from a feature perspective, we're starting to be in a relatively good shape. It's not about introducing something as traumatical as SharePoint framework extensions. Sure, adding more extensions, but not as a completely new time. And this gives us then the opportunity of starting to polish and maintain and improve existing stuff, which funny enough is actually what our engineers are asking us to do as well. So they're like, can we stop rushing and introducing new stuff? Can we just make the existing stuff better? Which is a funny thing because then we have other teams and engineering teams who been actually maintaining and improving and obviously they're saying can we start implementing new stuff so it's it's yeah, kind yeah. of a mixed <laughs> yeah but yes, it's, it, it all comes down to is it is this interesting dynamic of managing a product right at some point like depending where you're at you might be at some point come come to the point where you say you know the market needs this we have this there is a gap that we need to close and yeah. then at some point you're like, okay, we support 80% of the 90% of the most important thing. We can spend more effort on the remaining 10, or we can make the life even easier for 80. And then you will leave the room for the custom dev or partner yeah. development. You know, that will remain as something that needs to be done by third party. Yeah. Yeah. As long as there is a way. Right. I yeah. think a few people also think that you know Microsoft is a humongous, huge company, and there's what are you trying to say? They are not. <laughs> no, <laughs> are obviously, but <laughs> there's not unlimited resources to work on. They, 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 they don't. Yeah. <laughs> what? But, but one you? way of actually. My, my Friday goes like you smoke. <laughs> <laughs> so, one way of actually, even if you think about the SPFX dev team, uh, I, I, I can't go to an exact details because I don't want to, uh, because people will probably freak out. But, um, um, but it, it, it oh, is. You already people, went in details now. <laughs> yeah. So, but it, it's, it's, it's almost like a startup, uh, which we are building. And sure, then we have our internal customers who are improving and building their components uh, on top of that. So out of the box experiences are all built on top of SPFX, but but sure, you might consider that as a startup inside of the bigger company because it yeah. acts super agile. Uh, we have few PMs and, and then uh, engin uh, engineers actually implementing stuff on top of the specs and planning of the PMs. Um, but it's not like the Satya or Rushes is actually saying uh, what needs to be done in SPFX. No, 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 no. We are actually controlling that, and and we are making those and decisions. It, it makes sense. It makes and sense. And aligning like they, that yeah. So. yeah, but but I mean, they they don't scale at that point across Microsoft. Everything Microsoft, from AI yes. to Azure to cloud to Dynamics through Xbox you know? to, to <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> Sorry to break it for you. No. Okay. <laughs> but I guess. Yeah. And and I think that startup or not, I don't think I don't think that that is the point, right? Because no matter how big your dev team is, there's always a limit to it. Sure. And sure. developing a product, that is one difference that I experienced myself, like coming from from project world. Project ends, right? It has a start, it has the end. You build the things that are spec, and you're done. There is, uh, um, uh, you ship it, delivery, you close it, and you're done. Yep. That is never the case in product. There is always more work than hours in a day. It's a never-ending process. Yep. There's always, no matter how many people you have, there will always be more work. You might ship more in le le less time, but there will always be improvement because the moment you ship things, you give them to customers, 
they will come up with an, another requirements, ideas, ideas improvements, and so yeah. forth. And there will them. always yeah. be more, more or or work. So the illusion yeah. that you know what, let's get things done. You will never do that, no matter yeah. how many people you throw at it. Yeah, absolutely. The question is more on when is it good enough for shipping? And then uh, you need to have this kind of an improvement uh, mindset, uh, which is yeah. the, the fact that you're not a perfectionist because that would mean that you're never shipping. Yeah. Um, but if yeah. you're improvement, you are accepting the realities and you're able to ship a version, but then you keep on improving and improving and improving. It's an endless cycle of improving yeah. what, what is yeah. happening there. And the key point there is to help everybody to understand the, what's being shipped, what it's yeah. supposed to do, what it's meant to do, and what, what's next. Yep. Right. And not trying to say like, yeah, we solve problems. Yeah. But you only did this one thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, so it's, it's really important to help people to understand we ship this as a first stage to address this one, one issue. And we're looking into doing issue two, it's three, and, and, yeah. and, and for two. Yeah. Which I think we've been done a relatively good job with SPFX because we're being quite open and honest on what are we doing and what are we shipping and what are we addressing and and then if something is a gap or something isn't working we we openly say that it's not working so yeah. uh, because I, I think that's a highly beneficial thing for everybody this kind of a relates on a and, and <laughs> relates on a, a one accident what we had earlier this week uh, which was a quite big uh, accident on the on the content types and uh, and the fields and the uh, reorder of fields which had a server side api issue um my mindset and i think we're heading there as a company as well which is good is that we need to go and jump and openly say that when we do a mistake we openly go to them to the github and we have an open communications on the issue where are we progressing and when is it actually identified? When is it actually closed? If there's any workarounds, rather than trying to hide things and having a one-to-one -one isolated discussions, that's not beneficial. We yeah. work in the scale, in the global scale. We need to be able to go and boot our own, I can't say this out, we were out loud. This you need to put the money where the mouth is? Is Office, that the, yeah, the, that's, right, that's the right expression? That. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, you and develop basic, trust. Yeah. Even, even if the stuff breaks sometimes, you develop trust by having a healthy transparency, I'd yes. say. Yes. Well, I think so. I think there are two sides to it, right? Because it's trust versus trust in a way, right? You build trust <laughs> by being open and transparent on the other hand like people want to be able to rely on you that things are right and sometimes yeah. it mean not showing everything yeah, yeah. because if Absolutely. if you open up too much people will be like oh, That's true oh as well. my god yeah. no, no 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 like yeah i don't want to like the moment you know the way sausage is made you don't want to have it yeah. Yeah, that's true. But let's not actually, and that's definitely we, we don't want to actually, and that's that that's among all of the IT companies in the world. So um, well, you don't want to everything. Actually it's with the meat industry. It's with yeah. everything. Like yeah, that's true. That's true. There is like, people want to be able to. People like, don't want to know. People don't want to take. The sometimes, sometimes knowing less is better. It puts yes, you at absolutely. ease. That yes. and having somebody taking care of the, you know, ironing out the wrinkles. The, the, yeah. This is good. As long as yeah. you know, sure, once in a while things might go wrong, but there is somebody on it. Somebody yeah. owns it. Things will be fixed. I will not be harmed. That is sure. all I, I want to know. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Makes sense. Now, moving on on oh, articles. Back to the news. <laughs> wow. We're, we're really jumping on, uh, on a different topic, but a good discussion, actually. Uh, regardless of the fact that this is the second take. Um, so oh, um, recording is uh, gone, gone again. Why, why does no, go no. Away? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Bad uh, job. I'm freaking out for a second. <laughs> so, um, so this one is from, uh, from Paula, managing AAD users, uh, Azure AD users with Microsoft Graph and BMP. So the BMP, new BMP templates and Paula, good job on, on Polo. Uh, selection. So let me jump on the on the right topic here. Uh, where do we actually have that? So the PMP templating engine, uh, starting from May 2019, is actually supporting uh, also managing Azure AD users. So you're able to actually create a PMP tenant template, and then which is actually creating Azure AD users. And this is basically intended to be used with the demo tenants. So you're able to actually set up a really kind of a large tenant template, and then you're able to apply that. And then you have a uh, the 
the licenses and the users and Azure AD and everything else defined uh, for cool. usage. So should be helpful for, for example, automatic testing if needed, if you need to really kind of stamp uh, new tenants on that. Good. Uh, moving on on things. Uh, which one was that? Uh, Multi-line test was field render as a single line. We just took some articles. Uh, uh, so uh, how to solve SPF multi-line field render in a single line text uh, issue, which comes trying to create a multi-line text box in SPFX. Mm -hmm. So let's see, uh, this is a multi-line text box. This is a rendered multi-line text. Ah, there we go. So how do we solve this challenge of a multi-line text here? And then it's being rendered uh, in a single line because we basically take just the, the text uh, which is added well, in. I mean, that is an HTML thing because HTML, when right. you put a multi line string in HTML, right. it will be a single right. line. Yes. So this blog post is basically walking through how do you take that into account and how do you then modify uh, the, the, the output in a way that it's actually uh, rendered in the right way. Well, so you can do this or you, you could do it in CSS. That is another option. You could do it in CSS as well. So in this case, what, what is being done is that it has a additional BR. So basically line feeds mm -hmm. added on the on the on the web part. So relatively simple story, uh, but it's a good reminder on the fact that the text boxes are uh, text and this is HTML. So it's a yep. slightly different uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, then in here from uh, 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 Prime, uh, there's a new version of the SharePoint client browser. If you're not aware of what is the SharePoint client browser, please have a look on this. This is absolutely brilliant tooling for getting insights of your SharePoint form, if it's on-prem or SharePoint online tenants. Uh, so absolutely, absolutely brilliant stuff. Um, what uh, Prime has been building this for quite a few years actually. Um, and basically what it provides you is a really nice insights uh, as so we're able to go to site collection, regional settings, lists, list items, properties, all of this everything stuff. inside. Yeah. Everything inside of the thing. So if you're kind of, a, as an example, if you're wondering, I think we, as an example, we pretty recently used this quickly to check what is the difference between the page template folder and page templates in the related on page temp, modern page templates. So we were able to figure out what are the property differences between the folders, which makes a modern page as a template rather than modern page. Yep. Because it exposes all of those properties and everything else. So yeah. really, 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 really great tool. Mm. Um, maybe one thing one, to notice. One improvement yeah. that I would that would see for that selfishly for myself, I would love this tool to be Electron so that I can run that on a Mac. Fair point. That is a good point uh, as well. Uh, and and then uh, Pram is sharing only the docs and uh, the actual releases. So he's not actually open sourcing the code, which would be good. And it would be probably beneficial for him as well so that other people can contribute uh, on this tool. So right now yep. he's managing that by himself, partly due to historical reasons. And, 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 and it's always the interesting thing. If you build something for 10 years, uh, do you actually want to put it as an open source solution? Because then all of the, the older decisions and historical things might be visible. Uh, but I mean, hey. everybody can disassemble the code anyway. So That's whatever true. you have that built. Is true. That's true as well. That is true. <laughs> Um, and then in here uh, from Search A, uh, what's new and what's changed in the SharePoint Online REST API between March and April 2019. Uh, so Search A has created this REST API uh, metadata uh, explorer, which is a really, really, really cool tool. Uh, so it basically is, is listing uh, what uh, the REST APIs and what's available and being getting exposed there. Uh, it is automatically basically scanning the, the metadata uh, of the OData uh, endpoint. Really cool stuff. Uh, and this is basically a list of things what has been changed related on the REST APIs uh, behind of the scenes. So comparing the older versions and the newer version. Maybe one thing to notice here uh, is that um, the fact that the REST API exists, it doesn't mean that it's available for third party. Uh, so uh, it doesn't mean that it's intended to be used by a third party. So we might actually change that uh, unless it's documented and then we document any changes and we do the versioning or precisely. So the challenge is that we might actually, and, and we need to do this all the time. So we, we implement a new web part in engineering. Uh, we need to have a new specific API for it. We introduce the API, but it's not intended for third party. And then we modify the API still until it is actually released properly. So please be aware of that. Um, good. 
uh, and then the last piece was here uh, BMP provisioning templates. This is a company called Provision Point, uh, but they're using the BMP provisioning templates behind of the scenes, um, and it's an interesting way of combining the business uh, and then uh, to the open source uh, templating. Uh, it's not a massive blog post, but it's actually interesting to say that people are able to build their businesses based on top of the open source uh, tooling as well. Um, which in the case of BMP provision templates, I think that's relatively safe. There's more than thousands, there's multiple, multiple thousands of customers and partners using BMP templates every single month. So mm. uh, it's quite safe and everything what we do in the BMP templates and BMP in general are designed to be backward compatible. So whenever there's a API changes, everything else, though, are, those have been implemented in backward compatible ways. Uh, so it's almost being acted as a product uh, from that perspective. Good. Almost uh, is a product. <laughs> well, it is a product, kind of like CLI is kind of a product, but it's 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 an yeah. So it, it is a product. It is a product. Period. Yeah. Period. Fair point. Fair point. <laughs> yeah, it has releases. It has documentation. It's a specific thing, and it's Correct. never done. Yeah. That it has true. all characteristics of a product. That is true. What makes a product a product? That's that's good. It's never uh, done. <laughs> yes. Well, I think in IT industry, nothing is never done, completed, or uh, so. projects are. Well, yeah, but is the output of the project ever actually completed? Well, no. that's, that's, the individual that's project different is. Different are you yeah. fully learned? Haven't you learned everything there is to learn? Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A long time ago already. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You're a product. I learned everything. So. You're a product. <laughs> Because I'm completed. I can retire. Uh, I can work with these skills for 20 years, 20 years, and then I can retire. Sure. Hey, actually, the worst part is that you actually could, and that's in a way is scary. Uh, hey, what? <laughs> oh, you actually could. You actually keep doing what you're doing. What, what, based on what you know now, you could retire. There are companies that are still on premise. There are, sure. there are companies sure. still that used 2003. Sure. That so there will still be companies that are on 2016, 19 for the foreseeable time. Fair point. Fair point. Good point. Well, the other thing is, do you want to do that? But that that's different. yeah, that's a separate discussion, I think. Probably yeah. like no. Yeah. Next. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any last words? Uh, it is Friday before SPC. EZS is coming. It's going to be pretty busy two weeks. Uh, Simon is coming to European Collaboration Summit uh, in Wiesbaden. Well, that yeah. you'll be there as well uh, yep. for one of the pre days and few sessions. Uh, Only I'll one. be there as one, well. One session. One yeah. session. It's been a pretty uh, hectic May, at least for me, because I was in Build last week as well, and now Las Vegas and then this part. But uh, hey, it comes with the territory. It seems to be, I don't know what's with this May thingy. Why are we always in May? Why, why is, what is causing this? Well, so, so we worked for the first few months. Now we have something to show. And then before, we don't want to wait, wait too long because then people are away for holiday. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's like, and, it's and just I like think right in the middle thing. Cram everything together and... Yes. Yeah. And I think the fact that Ignite used to be, at some point it was in September. Actually, Ignite at some point was in May as well, because based on my Facebook historical tweets, um, and there's always the reminders. You were at Ignite at some point. There was a, there was a one year where we had built uh, in, uh, San in, April. in uh, San Francisco in late April. And yep. then the next week there was Ignite in Chicago. Correct, correct. Which was yes. super weird as well. It's like, well... Why are we even having two overlap or partly overlapping conferences? It's well, slightly because weird. there was developer audience and there was the ID Pro. And I think back in the day, that was the way we sure. thought about these events. Identify right? ourselves. And, yeah. and Microsoft still, well, I, I, we used to identify everybody either as a technic person or as an MSDM person. Luckily, that has gone already away. So. Yeah, but DVDs. But DVDs, <laughs> DVDs, DVDs yes. that is so true. Like, like the, the bundles, oh. the bundles of like every, I don't know, every, you got every single month. Quarter, or, yes, like, quarter, you got to here's your, your CDs, yes. Here's your oh, MSDM building. subscription. And that's the interesting part. And, the of time. <laughs> and that is the interesting part. Like, I recall that was in 2000, I don't know, seven or eight, being developer on, on, that was on when Oz. You were 14, so. Yes. Yeah. Um, when, you wanted to build a virtual PC yep. of, of your dev um, oh, yeah, environment. Yes. Yeah, with so, the Microsoft virtual PC stuff. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, absolutely. So SharePoint would ship as MSDN, but Windows would be TechNet. Yeah. But it was like, 
So how am I like? Where am I supposed to install that? Yeah, not our problem. <laughs> and then yeah, because Technet CDs were shipped in a separate. That's a good point. There was actually separate a, subscription. Subscription, yeah, and the, the MSD and Ultimate subscription with all of the the CDs wasn't cheap either. It was no, really no 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 no. That massive. was expensive. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about that. There is. There's still an MSDM subscriptions, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Absolutely, because that gives you the access to Visual Studio Ultimate. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Which, and, well, as a Microsoft employee, I don't need to think about the licensing, so. Uh, it's, it's expensive. Just, yeah, yeah, okay. It's good to know, good to know. Uh, and one of the number one rules, by the way, which is like, why isn't Microsoft employees never know about the licenses? One of the number one rules as a Microsoft consultant or as a PM or as an engineer is that you do not talk about licensing. You do com not com talk about licensing at all. Compartmentalize no, no. knowledge. The, the problem is that the licensing is such a wizardy thingy, and every single country, every single region has their own way of, of defining the licensing, is partly, uh, is that you do not want to actually make a, any indications out of the license costs for anybody. because Plus, that's... there are always things like the enterprise agreements, and there Correct. are different ways Correct. to go around it, and right. customers Absolutely. have benefits because of reasons. and. It's sales. Yeah, Whenever there is sales. sales, you don't want to come up with a number because yes. it's like nine out of ten times. It's not true. Yeah, that is true. That's true. It's not factual. And that's why yes. we are in software business because it's factual. Or Unless you, you, you buy a Tesla. That is probably the only thing you can buy for, for, for which you know at the exact price. <laughs> You don't know the electric usage consumption or never. No, 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 but um, I mean purchase price, right? <laughs> like if you want to buy any other car, you go to uh, the uh, the dealership, shit, negotiate, and then you can get something off. That's not the case in Tesla. In Tesla, you Except go to the in, website, in you go, you pay that, and it's done. And we don't. I don't negotiate. I go to a yeah, but car. Because you and... don't doesn't mean you could not. Just That's because we're finished. We are the same. Yes. We're like, okay, so should I give you some more money for this car? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Am I all right taking this now? <laughs> yeah. You no, know, for for Finnish culture and and let's close up to this. For Finnish culture is that you give me a price and there's a price and it's the same price for everybody. If okay. what do we mean that it's a separate price based on the calculation? Why? It is the same price for everybody because that's how it should be. That's the right thing to do and that's beneficial for everybody. Uh, um, yeah, that's yeah. That's that's a cultural thing. That is just yes, it's, it is. it's more hey. And and even in Sweden, it's different. Uh, Sweden people negotiate a lot, and then they come up with a different ways of agreeing things. And so. then you have the Dutch, yeah, who live I think from trade saying, for centuries now. <laughs> one last joke <laughs> about this one. I was thinking this yesterday or this morning when I was walking out with the dog. And uh, the differences between the culture. I think it was something like uh, when there's a 9 a.m. meeting in the morning with a customer. The difference is between Swedes are that Swedes are still negotiating who's going to be on that 9 a.m. meeting in the morning uh, when the meeting actually happens. Uh, the, the Germans will be arriving on that meeting at 9 a.m. in the morning sharp and they will open the customer door at 9 because they're precise and they will be there at 9 because we agreed that it will be 9. The difference between Finns and Germans is that we actually arrive 10 to 15 minutes before 9 and then we circle around the house until it's nine. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that we are just in absolutely case. precisely. Yes, just in case, and we are absolutely precisely on on there at the same time. So <laughs> cultural differences. So. On that bombshell. <laughs> exactly. Cool. I think that's it. Uh, thank you for this one. A uh, few failures. Uh, it took much longer than we were planning, uh -huh. but hey, these things do happen. Uh, and hopefully, this recording was successful. We'll see. And um, we'll see you in uh, the B spot and. Uh, both of you. We will have, uh, I will get this one recorded, and uh, we will have uh, quite a few of these uh, stickers in, uh, in SPC and VSPOT and uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, Parker stickers waiting for everybody who is joining us. Um, so see you there. Thank you. And each one will be num num uniquely numbered. Signed yes. and, and yeah, signed. uniquely numbered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, let's do that. Just but thank you everybody for watching. Thing. <laughs> thank you, Simon, for your time as well. Sorry for taking some extra time on this. Um, well, thank you. Thanks for having um, me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.